So we're going to begin with some overview. And there's some chapters in the Book of Mormon that we'll need to go back to. So we're going to do a little bit of rewind. We'll do some fast forwarding. And then we'll come back actually into 2 Nephi. So let's begin with the yeah, First so, Nephi 19. So it's interesting that uh, it's Nephi who who gives us more Isaiah chapters than any, any other prophet in the Book of Mormon. He is coming out of Jerusalem in 600 BC. Well, Isaiah was a prophet in the kingdom of Judah from Nephi's hometown. He was a, a, a court prophet. He, he lived with the kings. He prophesied with the, the people in the, the king's court here from about 740 to 701 BC. So it's not that far in the past for Nephi and Jacob. It's like a hundred years. Yeah. And so this is kind of his his hero as far as scripture writing is concerned. So he he loves Isaiah and he's going to use him more than anybody. In fact, it's it's interesting if you go back to 1 Nephi 19:23, Nephi tells us that he was reading scriptures to his brothers. He says I did read unto them that which was written by the books of Moses, basically. So, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Well, we know from 1 Nephi that he's been focusing a lot on Exodus, and Exodus isn't that hard to understand compared to other books in Scripture, but you can picture Nephi reading to his brothers out of the books of Moses and saying, you're not making the connection, are you? And Laman looking at Lemuel saying, you getting it? No, I'm not getting it. No, we're not getting it. <laughs> they didn't do their homework. And Nephi says, okay. Now look at the interesting transition in, in chapter 19, verse 23, when he says, but that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord their Redeemer, I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah. For I did like in all scriptures unto us that it might be for our profit and our learning. So they're not fully ma- connecting the dots with, with Moses' writings. So he says, let me make this more obvious. Let's turn over to Isaiah. Most people today wouldn't turn to Isaiah to make something more obvious, but Nephi does because it's very obvious to him. And we hope that it'll become more obvious to you as we look at what the Book of Mormon has said about Isaiah and that it'll invite you to see, oh, I see Jesus, I see my Savior, and my Redeemer revealed in the words of Isaiah. So the other place to, to look is if you flip over to 3 Nephi chapter 23, this is a chapter where Jesus is among the Nephites and the Lamanites in the Americas. It's on his second day of, of his ministry here in the Americas, and he just got through quoting to them Isaiah 54 which is one of the sweetest chapters of the entire scriptural canon about God's mercy and his grace and coming back to fulfill the covenant in spite of our unworthiness. He just finishes with quoting that that beautiful chapter all about himself, and then in chapter 23 he opens it by saying, and now behold, I say unto you that ye ought to search these things, yea, a commandment I give unto you that you search these things diligently, for great are the words of Isaiah." You'll notice that he didn't say, I command you to read Isaiah. He said, a commandment I give unto you to search these things diligently. You can't just read Isaiah. You have to search him diligently. It takes great effort. And that's our goal today is to make it so that when you come to an Isaiah chapter in the future, you don't say, oh, man, I'm going to either skip it or just gloss over it so I can say I read it, but to help you actually search it diligently so you can fulfill a commandment from the Lord. It's a really interesting word. Uh, We work at the university and one of the main things we try to help our learners do is learn how to be better learners. And sometimes as learners we have bad habits. We want the easy way out, like I'm going to just read something kind of quickly and not really have my brain on, but I'll just kind of let my eyes wander across the page and then I'll call it good. Or maybe I'll watch a video and call it good. And that's done. And searching actually requires quite a bit of effort. I mean, you think about search and rescue. It's not read and rescue, right? You're out there trudging through the hills and you're working with other people and you're collaborating and, and it's, it's effort and you're sweating a bit it's not always necessarily fun, but the payoff is incredible. And we have to spend some time with our students helping them improve their searching skills, their study skills, their learning skills. So one thing for us to remember in order to be able to fulfill this commandment from the Lord 
is recognizing that pattern that we've talked about before where the prophets in the Book of Mormon will always introduce something to do with the chapter that they're going to quote. So before giving you Isaiah chapter or chapters, they're going to give you some introduction, then they're going to give you the commentary. It's fascinating with the largest Isaiah block in the entire Book of Mormon being the one here in 2 Nephi that everybody talks about famously, which is chapter 12 through 24, it, it's really important that we see that Nephi opens this up by saying, look, I had Jacob, my brother, give you some chapters from Isaiah because Isaiah has seen the Lord like I have seen him, and Jacob, my brother, has seen the Lord. So his introduction is, I'm going to read you more of Isaiah because Isaiah is an eyewitness of God, which we're going to get in chapter 16, and I'm an eyewitness of God, and Jacob, my brother, is an eyewitness of God. We have three witnesses that Jesus is the Christ in this case because Nephi is going to give you his name, Jesus Christ, in chapter 25. Uh, Jacob gave you his name, Christ, his title Christ, in chapter 10. First time in the Book of Mormon where you got Christ was from Jacob after reading Isaiah. Full name and title is chapter 25 after Nephi reads you this big chunk. I think these two brothers have a message for us. I think they're serious about the fact if you want to understand the Lord your Redeemer better, then dive into Isaiah because you're going to see him and you're going to recognize him more fully. Among all the other things that Isaiah is prophesying, you're going to come to know your Savior and you're going to know not just his name but your covenant connection to him better. So that, that helps us as we dive in. And let me just share briefly, names matter. And it's interesting how Nephi, when he talks about Jesus, early on he usually uses the phrase, the Lamb of God or the Messiah. These are very Hebrew things to say. The word Messiah means the anointed one. And it's interesting that we, when he starts to use the word Jesus Christ, those are Greek words and they actually had to be revealed. That's right. To Nephi, he would not have known Greek and so they're revealed to him and the word Jesus Christ, Christ is the Greek version of the word Messiah and Jesus comes from the Hebrew word Joshua which means Savior. In fact, Isaiah's name is a variant of the word Joshua. Jehovah saves. Or Jesus and it literally means Jehovah saves. So it just all comes together that all these names are witnessing about what Jesus does for us. Okay, now a couple of other really simple um, yet important uh, foundational principles to help you as you dive into your study of, of the Isaiah chapters. Um, we live in a world that is dominated by a Greek mindset. These ancient Greeks, they, they speak very literally. They see the world in a literal way. The Hebrews, especially Hebrew poets, like Isaiah is a Hebrew poet, like Zenos in your Book of Mormon is going to be giving us Hebrew poetry, they speak using symbols. And this is like Lehi's dream. Lehi's dream. Or Nephi's vision. Very, very symbolic, which means instead of saying this means this, they simply paint a picture for you and sometimes they'll give you interpretation, but they'll leave it open for layer upon layer upon layer of fulfillment. It's really quite powerful. Let me give you just a simple example from Isaiah. A Greek statement would be, if you've sinned, you can repent and be forgiven. Just say it. I just said it. That's the reality. A Hebrew poet would never say it that way. A Hebrew poet would say something like, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It's not just using symbols, but it's symbolic repetition. You say something with symbols and then you say it again with symbols and it creates this almost like you have two eyes now, it gives a depth to what they tried to teach you, but you can keep learning lessons from that for the rest of your life. It's kind of like people going to the temple of our God today and putting on only Greek lenses and looking at everything that takes place in an endowment or an initiatory setting or a sealing setting or in a sacrament meeting 
with only literal lenses, and sometimes you walk out going, well, that was weird, when in reality God is teaching us layered lessons over time, things that are waiting to be uncovered and revealed as we get the symbolic eyes to see and learn lessons. That is what happens with the Book of Mormon and its use of Isaiah, or if you read Isaiah just straight out in the, in the Bible, is you can keep learning lessons for the rest of your life at deeper and deeper and deeper levels. And sometimes in our modern world, because of the scientific revolution, this, this Greek worldview, we believe that truth can only be found through literalness, and God's like, I'm the God of truth. We can do literal truth and we do symbolic truth, and sometimes we get ourselves mixed up is because we don't see things literally, and we're like, well, if it's only literal, it's true. If it's symbolic, it's not true. And at the university, we have to deal with this and help students see that our role in life is to find and accept all truth. And if we only put ourselves into the Greek literal worldview, we will miss the fullness of truth that God has to offer us. So, last item before we actually open up the, the scripture block of the Isaiah chapters is to go to the end. So, Nephi's just given you chapters 12 through 24. It's really easy to remember in the Book of Mormon because you just subtract 10. So, if it's chapter 12 in the Book of Mormon, 2 Nephi, then it's chapter 2 in Isaiah. So, it's chapters 2 through 14 of Isaiah, some of those very, very initial chapters that Nephi is quoting to us. He finishes that, and then in chapter 25, after closing Isaiah, now he says, now let me explain why a lot of people don't understand Isaiah. So we would invite you to pause the video here and turn to 2 Nephi chapter 25, verse 1 through 8, and read it carefully, study it carefully, and look for keys that Nephi gives you to help unlock meaning and understanding in the, in the book of Isaiah, and in some cases why he tells us the reasons people don't understand Isaiah. We hope that you found a whole series of things um, that, that Nephi's talking about, and we're not going to list all of them and they're not going to be in order here, but we're going to just cover a couple of them very quickly. You'll notice that he said, unless you understand the manner of prophesying among the Jews, then you're not going to understand Isaiah because he's a Hebrew poet and, and he is a seer. And what is a seer? He's a seer. He, mm -hmm. he sees things. Past, present, future, he reveals things. You've got some great insights on the word prophet and, what, yeah, and a it, revelation. This is really interesting. We often think that prophets only talk about the future and they do talk about the future, always in this covenantal context of the consequences of keeping or not keeping the covenant. And if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, God is speaking through Moses, revealing his will to the people of how he wants them to be covenantally loyal. And he says to the people, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Now, we think the word perfect means on without sin. It actually means be loyal to God in the covenant. Do the things he's asked you to do. And then he goes on and God says, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. So Moses is not always going to be with the people, but he's kind of the ideal or paradigmatic or exemplary prophet, and God saying, I will raise up other prophets like him. And what do prophets do? They teach God's covenantal words. Isaiah is one of those prophets. And of course, the main example is Jesus Christ, who reveals the fullness of God's covenants. When prophets are prophesying, they're always talking about God's covenants. And they're not going to come out and say, I'm talking about God's covenants, they, but they will be speaking God's words and what God expects of us. And that's what Isaiah is doing, and that's what Nephi is trying to help us understand. He's helping us to understand the consequences of being in God's covenant or not being in God's covenant, being loyal and faithful to what God had revealed to the people at Mount Sinai or in subsequent revelation. So, Knowing that, it's really important to see that when you read in Isaiah, because he's a seer, he's a prophet, he's a revealer of God's covenant, God's words, God's connection with the people, he's going to be writing about events. Now, you can look at uh, the, the writings of Isaiah and say, I wonder what he is telling us about his own time period. 
based on Nephi and Jacob and their connection with Christ. I wonder what he's seeing – I wonder what he's seeing from Christ's time period and how Christ is the ultimate fulfillment of a lot of these things that are going on, and I wonder what he's seeing in our day because Nephi tells us that in the day, in verse 7 and 8, in the day that these Isaiah prophecies are going to be culminating and being fulfilled, then the people will understand them and, and love Isaiah more. Well, we're living in that day. It doesn't mean that that's the only fulfillment of his writings because he's so good they find layered fulfillment through time, but finally in our day they're going to culminate. Oh, and by the way, just for fun, this won't get you into heaven, but if he's a seer, wouldn't it be nice if he had two eyes? <laughs> and in our case, we're good, and only good pupils will get that joke. You'd also mentioned how his brothers may have struggled, Laman and Lemuel, to fully understand Isaiah because they didn't understand that Isaiah is speaking about these different time periods and the fulfillment of God's covenants. And since we now live in the latter days, well, we have the advantage because we actually know about Isaiah's day. We have resources on that. We know about Christ's day. That's what the New Testament's about. And we live in the latter days, and so we can see how Isaiah's words apply to us today. And that's ultimately why the Book of Mormon was revealed, is to help draw us into seeing how prophets have spoken to us so we can be saved yeah. in the unfolding embraces of Jesus Christ. Which makes the statement, uh, we did liken all scriptures unto us, it, it, it makes sense now we can say, regardless of what Isaiah meant and everybody else's, he's inviting us to liken all of Isaiah's writing to us today in, in the latter days, which is beautiful. Another reason that he says that people don't understand Isaiah is because they don't have the spirit of prophecy with them, or if we have the spirit of prophecy, which is the spirit by which the words were written, if the same spirit that inspired Isaiah to see and write certain things is with us, in reading and interpreting them, then we'll be able to see more clearly. Um, but if we don't have the spirit of prophecy, then we can end up in endless debates about what it meant or what it didn't mean, and at the end of the day, because of the layered symbolism and the multiple fulfillments, it, it may not be a very fruitful discussion – or fruitful debate, rather. Another thing that he talks about is Nephi comes out of Jerusalem he knows all about the geography surrounding the kingdom of Judah and the kingdoms of Israel and Syria, and his children didn't come out of there. They, they, they were born in the wilderness, and they, he hasn't taught them all of that, and so he says they're a little confused about this. So really fast, this will be quick, and if you understand just this 30,000 – actually this uh, 26,000 – mile – or a foot, rather, overview of geography, it, it'll help put a lot of his writings into context. There's the Dead Sea, there's the Jordan River, there's the Sea of Galilee, here's Nazareth where Jesus was raised. There are two kingdoms, two major kingdoms in this land. You have the Kingdom of Israel up north with the ten tribes. You have the Kingdom of Judah down south with the two tribes, and of course Levi is scattered among them because he's the only one with priesthood, so there are really thirteen tribes because of Ephraim and Manasseh, but there you go. So Baker's does it. There you go. Up north you have the kingdom of Syria. Up to the northeast you have the kingdom of Assyria. To the east you have the kingdom of Babylon. To the south and to the west you have the kingdom of Egypt. This is Isaiah's world. So if he's writing from 740 to 701 BC, there are major events that we're familiar with in the Old Testament that are current events for him. So for instance, Syria is going to combine with Israel, which is often referred to in Isaiah as Ephraim, because it's kind of the, the – he's the leader of the group here – Syria becomes confederate with Ephraim in chapter 17, for instance, and says, let's go fight against the kingdom of Judah. So that's what chapter 17 and 18 is about, is them wanting to come together and the Lord telling Isaiah, don't worry, they're not going to come and fight you. So when you get to 17 and 18, just know that's what's happening and all of a sudden 
it makes more sense. You, you can start piecing the elements of the story together better. God tells Isaiah, don't worry, they're not going to be able to come because before they do, Assyria is going to come to town and wipe out these two kingdoms, but then Assyria is going to keep coming and is going to besiege uh, Jerusalem after wiping out all of the other cities of Judah, and Assyria comes in 721. You'll notice it's right in the halfway point. Isaiah is living through this, so when you get to chapters uh, 20, 21, 22, pay attention to the Assyrian references, and that's the Assyrian conquest. That is where we lose the ten tribes of Israel. And they're called carried the, away captive. the ten last tribes. That all happened right in Isaiah's time period. We don't know where they went. And so pay attention to that in 20, 21, and 22. Then when you get to chapters 23 and 24, that's Babylon coming to the kingdom of Judah right after Lehi left, which is for Isaiah more than a hundred years in the future when Babylon's going to come and carry them away captive. And then you get the, the Jews in exile, so read chapters 23 and 24 from that context. If you understand basic geography in the different kingdoms, all of a sudden it, it does open up and unlock some of the history so that you can then understand what happened back then and more easily liken those stories of history to our day today. We were going to talk with you guys about some basic ways of looking and searching in Isaiah and seeing the patterns for how he prophesies. And you were telling me earlier about this kind of multifaceted deep layer that he works through yeah. where he will say something and it can actually refer to his day, Christ's day, our, our day. day. And previous to him and that's what a seer does, that's what a prophet does, he reveals things from a heavenly perspective. So let's pick it up. Let's, let's open up our first Isaiah chapter from, from uh, this big chunk, which is chapter 12 in 2 Nephi, and a lot of people have already written and said a lot of things about the, the mountain of the Lord's house, the temple being established in the top of the mountains. That could find fulfillment in Isaiah's day um, when the temple is, is at the top of the mountain in Mount Moriah, in Jesus' day Jerusalem. in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. in Jesus' day with Herod's temple, um, and it finds ultimate fulfillment with, with temples being built in the top of the mountains today in the latter days. So we're just going to kind of gloss over that one. Go to verse 8. Their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. Notice the repetition. He doesn't just say something once. He's, he repeats it and he's using symbols land full of idols, they worship the workmanship of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. Which time period? Is that just Isaiah's? Is that Jesus's? Is that both? Is that ours? Sounds like the human condition. Sounds like God's humans. like, I created you, I give you all these good things. And you build them up with your own hands and then worship them instead of me. And then you act like you're saving yourselves and you actually use the means of salvation to hurt people with it. Yeah. Turn over to verse 17. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord ex alone shall be exalted in that day. So there's an ultimate fulfillment of that prophecy in the millennium, but there are other layered fulfillments of that prophecy in Isaiah's day. These people were brought down. Their idols were literally brought down and abolished, and the Lord alone is exalted in that day, in the time of Jesus, the Roman conquest in 68, 69, 70 AD, that they are brought down and they are totally destroyed. Now look how he describes this. Instead of just saying it like a Greek, uh, a Greek mindset would prefer, which is, yeah, they're going to be destroyed and all their riches are going to be taken away. <laughs> Isaiah doesn't do that. He paints a symbolic picture for us. Look at verse uh, 18. The idols he shall utterly abolish, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth, for the fear of the Lord shall come upon them, and the glory of his majesty shall smite them. They've been worshiping these idols as gods. Now when the real thing comes to town, they're like, whoa, this, this is scary, and he's going to shake terribly the earth, it says. Verse 20. And in that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which he has made for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. I don't know about you, but it's way more powerful for me when you slow down and you stop reading and you start searching and you say, what, what message was Isaiah trying to communicate here? 
And why did he use – why did he pick the symbols that he did to communicate that thought to us as a seer? He picked two animals, mole and a bat. What do moles and bats have in common? They're two of the only animals in the whole world who do their there, – there are a lot of them, but these are the two major ones who do their work in the dark, who do their work without relying on sight. And if you stop and think about it, what is an idol of gold or an idol of silver to a bat? What does to, it look to like? To a blind bat. Or to a mole under the ground that comes across this idol. Does it say, oh, I found some gold. I'm, I'm rich. I, wow. I'm better a, than all the other God. moles. I'm better than every other mole down here. <laughs> that idol means no more to the bat and the, the mole than a polished rock would or even a non-polished rock. Isaiah is sharing a message with us that that which we have set up to be so important to us, even a mole and a bat who are totally blind can tell us their real worth. Nothing compared to the God of heaven who holds worlds without number in his hand. So it's a beautiful way if you can get out of the Greek mindset and put on Hebrew symbolism lenses when you're reading in Isaiah and just slow down, ask a lot of questions, hold up a verse and turn it and say, why did he pick that? Why did he say that? And you're not going to know all the answers because they're waiting to be revealed over time. You're going to keep getting them as you get more and more familiar with this manner of prophesying. That's just one little example. Every time I come back to these scriptures, I learn new things. It always always amazes me that there's always something new to learn. And I know people love to mark their scriptures. Maybe I shouldn't reveal this. I actually like to read a fresh set of scriptures so that I can see new things. If I'm so only looking at my insights from five years ago, I'm then actually like, whoa, okay, that's the only thing I can get out of this. So I try to pick up a fresh set of scriptures and see something new. Huh. And look at chapter, uh, verse 17 again, where Isaiah uses this interesting symbolism and he repeats it twice. He says, the loftiness of man, the pride, shall be bowed down. The haughtiness of men, the pride, shall be made low. Okay, so it's said twice. And then notice he says, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. But then Isaiah does not repeat himself. The Lord is so powerful in his exaltation, he is alone in his exaltation, so alone in his exaltation that Beautiful. Isaiah doesn't even need to repeat himself a second time, that literally he has to qu twice talk about the pride of people, but only once, and God is alone in that, that statement. It's just kind of a, a literary gem that I discovered some time ago. So let's just take another couple of simple examples as we go through. We're not trying to cover every verse. You're going to discover these over time as you, as you dig in. Go to chapter 13, look at verse 1. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole staff of bread and the whole stay of water. Now, you'll notice that uh, there's a very literal interpretation of this in Isaiah's, in Isaiah's day. When Assyria comes to town and they, they wipe out um, all the kingdom of Israel and Syria and then they start destroying the fenced cities of Judah and then they come and they besiege Jerusalem, God is allowing this to happen because his people have broken that covenant of I will be your God, you'll be my people, and I'll, I'll protect you. Well, they aren't his people. They've been off worshiping these idols. They, they don't want him to be their God, so he's allowing this punishment to come upon them, and the whole purpose of a siege is to cut you off from life-giving water and food, bread. So you can see the fulfillment in Isaiah's day very clearly in verse 1 that God's allowing them to lose their stay and their staff. And you can see that in Jesus' day. As they reject the Messiah and they reject the, the apostles, God allows the Romans to come in and take away and siege Jerusalem again, and that siege is ugly. It's awful. Now, here's the point. If all we do is read Isaiah with only a historical lens on, that's helpful, that's good, but there's a better way to do it, which is to read it with – understand the historical setting, but also do what Nephi said, which is liken all scriptures unto us. You stop and think about the covenantal connection we have with Jesus and with, with God, there's some real significance today that I don't think Isaiah intended back in his day, 
but Nephi invited us to liken it, so we're going to liken it, which is don't do things so that you get cut off from the bread and the water. The stay in the staff of life in a covenantal relationship with God is every week like food you and water. You have to keep getting it so you go every week to the sacrament table to reestablish and make that new covenant and restore that covenant with God. I want you to be my God. We'll be your people. We partake of the bread and the water. When does that get removed from somebody? Only when they've seriously transgressed that covenant to the point where a priesthood leader will say, let's hold off on the bread and water while we work to reestablish some understanding here of what it means to be in a covenant with Christ and with God. It's important here that we recognize we're in a covenantal community. We are saved individually, but in the context of families and communities. And what God has asked us is to come join with that community every week and renew that covenant. And remember, we talked about this in the, in the past, that we promise to keep the commandments. The commandments are the covenantal instructions for how we'll be loyal to God and to his people, how we'll love him and love his children. In return, we get the promise of his presence. We get the promise of his prosperity, which is his presence. And back in the time of, of Isaiah, we still feel this way today, the temple was in Jerusalem. And the people saw that the temple was the house of the Lord and his presence was with them. And later when they sinned so much against, against God, he eventually said, I left, my presence is left, and I'm taking you guys out of out of Jerusalem and into captivity into Babylon. And it's a little bit like our modern day. If you sin sufficiently and are not humble enough to repent, God's presence will not be immediately available to you. Now, it's there if you turn back and return to him. But if you continue to sin, as the people in the ancient times did, and that's why we have the scriptures to point out, here are the consequences of keeping the commandments or not. We get this presence and his prosperity when we keep the commandments. The opposite is true when we don't. And that message, if you, if you just keep the, the covenantal connection with God and these, these ordinances and these opportunities to be connecting points with God as you go through these Isaiah chapters and how Israel is breaking those connections, then these chapters become more clear. So we're not going to take any more time um, going through verse by verse by verse. That's where you get to dig in and keep that commandment from the Lord and search diligently these words. The two other things that we want to cover is our first chapter 16, which is Isaiah's prophetic call when he goes into the temple and he sees – Such a great chapter. He sees God. This is his – what we would call throne theophany, where he sees God sitting on a throne, surrounded with, with angels and look in verse 3, one cried unto the other and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Those three repeat holies, meaning our God is the holiest. This is superlative, it's supernal. Nobody is holier than our God or more perfect. And here's Isaiah in the presence of all these heavenly beings with God himself there and Isaiah doesn't feel like he belongs and he says, I, Woe unto me, verse 5, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Brothers and sisters, this is, this is beautiful when you take even Isaiah's calling and liken it unto us. The idea isn't that you be sinless, that you never mess up, you never make a mistake. The idea is, is you have the promise of a God to be with you constantly, the gift of the Holy Ghost. He is a God. He's a member of the Godhead and it's promised that even though you have unclean lips and you live in a land that is defiled and we make poor choices sometimes, the beauty of this is God sends one of the angels to go and get a live coal off of the altar, touch Isaiah's lips to purge them and to cleanse him. Well, he makes the promise to us every week and even, even day by day. As we remember him, we can have his spirit to be with us, to keep making it so our confidence can wax stronger and stronger in the presence of God 
even though we don't see him like Isaiah is directly seeing him. But that's kind of the message of the covenant path, isn't it? Yeah. Is to help you prepare so you can walk back to the presence of the Father and not shrink from his presence and say, I, I, I'm not at all comfortable, I don't belong. What I love about this passage is that Isaiah is humble enough to recognize that he needs healing, but he can't do it on his own. It's actually God or God's servant, this angel, who brings the healing power of the atonement to purge, to burn away his sins. And just a brief story, when I was younger, um, I still want to be in God's presence, but I felt like I could only be in God's presence if I'm perfect. I kind of feel like Isaiah, like, ah, oh, I'm unclean. And so there was a whole number of weeks where I did not partake of the sacrament because I'm not perfect. I said, I'm not going to partake of the sacrament until I'm perfect. I'm like, I'm not perfect yet, so I'm not going to take the sacrament. I kept trying to save myself. And finally I realized, I'm kind of a bit of a slow learner, God's like, no, 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 be humble and I will purge you. I will bring my atonement to you and purge you and I will make you clean. I thought I had to cleanse myself. And just like Isaiah, he acknowledged his woe and his, his fallen nature. He let God purge him. And when I finally realized that, I actually found that actually it was hard for me to have a good week when I hadn't partaken in the sacrament. It was harder for me to have the Spirit. Yeah. And so it got harder and harder. Finally, I realized, oh, I'm supposed to trust God and let him purge me and for me to communicate to him my covenantal loyalty. So I partook of the sacrament and I felt this wash of the Spirit, which empowered me to have a better week. Now, I'm still not perfect, but I'm in that covenantal relationship with God and I yeah. have experienced like Isaiah, that purging that can come as we accept the atonement. Now, to, f to finish up, we would invite you to, to go through each of these chapters, 12 through 24, with these Hebrew symbolic layered repetition lenses, looking for what is Isaiah seeing in his day, in Christ's day, in our day, in the millennial day. Allow yourself to slow down and, and ponder these things. But in closing, we want to take you to chapter 22. Of all of the chapters in this particular block of scriptures, this is perhaps the, the most hope-filled and, and, quite frankly, from my perspective, the easiest to understand because it, it's just pretty straight – it's more Greek almost in nature because it's more straightforward. And read verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. It's the shortest of the chapters and, in my opinion, it's by far the easiest to understand and it is extremely uh, hope-filled for anyone who's struggling on the covenant path. So, Lord bless you as you uh, fulfill this commandment of the Savior to search diligently the words of Isaiah.